At Parkes, in New South Wales, stands one of the most important radio telescopes in the world. Australian radio astronomy began in the 1940s. Several small instruments were built, and then this great 210-foot dish at Parkes was constructed. It's been in action now for more than 30 years, and it's as good as it was when first set up, perhaps even better. And it's been responsible for many major discoveries. Over the years, this telescope has made so many discoveries, it's very, very difficult to uh, mention them all. One of the earliest reasons for building this dish, of course, was in order to map out the southern part of our galaxy in the neutral hydrogen line. Um, that is, to estimate how much neutral hydrogen there is, which, of course, apart from stars, is the single most important constituent of our galaxy. Well, it did that job, and it did it extremely well, um, but at most telescopes that have been built, uh, it's not just the reason they were built for that makes them famous, but it's other things, the serendipitous discoveries. And, of course, the commissioning of this telescope in 1961 coincided with the discovery of the quasars. But at the time it was built, in 1961, we didn't know what the quasars were. They'd been discovered as radio objects emitting large amounts of radio energy, but there was nothing there at the same position on the sky. The reason is that the positions were not accurate enough. And in order to pinpoint uh, positions accurately, it was necessary for telescopes, radio telescopes, to do something very special. One way we now use is to use te two telescopes to get greater accuracy. But then that was not possible. The uh, principles of interferometry, as we now call it, um, just weren't uh, advanced enough. So this telescope did something very, very clever. It actually used the moon to occult 3C273, one of the strongest of the radio objects. And in so doing, by precisely timing the instant at which 3C273 disappeared behind the moon and reappeared out the other side, it was possible to give an exact position for it. And that led to the discovery of 3C273 um, as an optical image and the first of the quasars. Though that, that was not enough, this telescope for many, many years was the only radio telescope in the South. And it, therefore, it had the job of surveying, well, half the universe, you could call it. And uh, starting from its earliest days in 1964-65, and then again in uh, the late 1970s, during the 80s, it performed major surveys of the sky, discovering very many radio sources. Finally, the one I think that gives me the greatest pleasure, though I wasn't involved with it at all, was the discovery of the Magellanic Stream to find that our galaxy was connected to the nearest galaxies, the large and the small Magellanic Cloud, by a bridge of neutral hydrogen, was a discovery made by a team uh, largely of optical astronomers from Mount Stromlo using the Parkes telescope, but not the large Parkes telescope, but a smaller one that's adjacent to it. And in this way, they mapped it out in neutral hydrogen. And it now seems clear that the Magellanic Stream is a bridge of hydrogen that's been pulled out of our galaxy by the Magellanic clouds passing nearby. How does the design of the Park Stiff compare with that of the Lovell Telescope at Joshua Bank? Well, there's a lot of similarities and there are a few differences. The similarities are that they're both great telescopes, probably the most productive, efficient telescopes in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. The Lovell telescope, of course, was a little bit earlier. It uh, came online, I think, around 1957, whereas this one was four years later in 1961. But they are both large, single-dish telescopes, and the thing that single dishes do, best of all, is collect a huge amount of energy, um, and they can see reasonably fine detail. But for very fine detail, we need to go down to the array telescopes, where a lot of telescopes work together. As you say, the Parkes telescope is now quite old. How do you keep it in the forefront of radio astronomy? Well, the skeptics say that it's a question of uh, the old axe that's had several new blades and several new handles. That's not quite true. The reason the Parkes telescope has been so very productive over the years is simply that it was so well built in the first place. Of course, a lot of the design uh, innovation came from Barnes Wallace, the man of dam buster fame, uh, and uh, the Wellington bomber fame, too. Uh, but it, probably his greatest lasting monument is not the dam buster bombs, but is in fact this radio telescope. 
telescope. And this radio telescope has been so well done that we've been able to improve its surface, we've been able to make modifications to its drive system to bring it up to a telescope which, although it was only planned to have about a 15-year lifetime, has done far better than twice that. And we envisage that it's going to be for several years more. We've been hearing a great deal about pulsars. One particular pulsar has just been causing considerable interest. It's a member of a binary system, and it's in orbit around a hot star that we can see. Its path around the star is elliptical, and the two are now just about at their closest. So we're expecting some very interesting interactions. We know that uh, quite often massive stars come in twos, and they orbit about each other. We also know that massive stars end their lives in these supernova explosions. And when the supernova goes off, what gets left behind is this tiny little star that we call a pulsar. And it's only about 10 kilometers across, but it still weighs one and a half times the mass of our sun. So it's an incredibly dense object. Now, we also know that supernova explosions are very violent events. So quite often, the two stars will separate during the time of the supernova explosion. But if we're very lucky, the pulsar may remain in orbit about the massive star. Unfortunately, again, these massive stars have very strong stellar winds, and it makes the pulsar very difficult to see in radio waves because they get blocked out by the material coming off the big star. However, in this case, we happen to be very lucky in that the pulsar is in a very elliptical orbit, and that means for quite a lot of its journey, it's a long, long way away from the big star. And that means that the radiation, the radio radiation, can get through to us. So the pulsar takes three and a half years to go around the big star, and um, in, over these next two weeks, it'll be very close to the big star. And the distance is about, the distance from Sun to, the, Sun to Venus is about the, the closest they'll approach each other. And so this is a very exciting event for us. Is it the first time an event of this kind has been observed? Yes, it is, because this is the only radio pulsar known to be orbiting a, a massive star. And uh, because it's in such a long orbit, it was only discovered three years ago. And so this is the first time that we'll observe this closest approach. What's the importance of this particular binary pulsar? We've observed already two massive stars in a binary orbit. We've observed X-ray binaries, where you have a neutron star and a massive star giving off X-rays. And we've observed uh, double neutron star systems. Now, we think they're all linked together in some way. But we were always had the missing link, which was a radio pulsar in orbit around a main sequence star. And this is exactly what we've got in this case. So this is the missing link between all those systems. And we think that's the way the systems evolve. So that's why this system is particularly interesting. What's the present state of the event? What have you actually been observing? Here at Parks, what we saw was that the pulses from the pulsar disappeared about two weeks ago. And that's more or less as we expected, because as the pulsar gets close in to the massive star, the wind is occulting the pulses. However, we've been looking at the pulsar at Narrabri with the Australia Telescope Compact Array. And at Narrabri, we can see that there's a very strong source at the position of the pulsar. And it's about five or six times stronger than, we, than the pulsar normally is. So at the moment, we're trying to decide what exactly is going on. One of the most important developments in radio astronomy is to use not one radio telescope alone, but a whole collection of telescopes working together, as with the Merlin system in England. The system over here is known as the Australia Telescope. And this great 210-foot dish at Parkes is part of it. Radio astronomers have learned how to link the different telescopes in order to provide um, something with the capability of seeing much finer detail. Any telescope sees, a good telescope sees not only faintly, for which it needs to collect large amounts of energy because they're so faint from the edges of the universe, which is what we're often looking at, but also it needs to see finely. Now, Parkes is very good at seeing faintly, not quite so good at seeing the fine detail. For that, we need a large array of telescopes, which is what Narrabri is. But by having both our own uh, facility and our sister facility at Narrabri, we've got the game pretty well covered, and we can uh, do world-class radio astronomy. The Australia Telescope is made up of several large radio dishes distributed around the southeast of Australia. The main array is here at Narrabri, 200 miles north of Parks. Yes, here at Narrabri we have six antennas, each 22 metres in diameter, and they're uh, on a rail track so that we can actually move them anywhere over a distance of about six kilometres. Uh, these antennas each weigh something like 270 tonnes, 
and uh, they can point with quite remarkable precision, uh, something like uh, 500th of a degree for, for such big antennas. How does the network work? Well, we combine signals from these antennas spread out, as I say, over this uh, fairly large distance by bringing the signals back to a central point uh, on optical fibres. And we bring back about 2,000 million numbers per second from each antenna to, to do that combination. What are the other elements of the telescope? The other parts of the telescope are uh, located much further away and the idea being that uh, the bigger the array, the finer the detail you can see. So we can combine the signals from these antennas at Narrabri with others at uh, Coonabarabran, Parks, uh, Tidbinbilla, Hobart, covering well over a thousand kilometres and indeed with antennas in other countries uh, giving us effectively antennas almost the size of the Earth. How do you combine the signals from the various elements? Well, of the uh, elements that are located here at Narrabri, we, we combine them in a, in a very special supercomputer which does something like two million million multiplications per second. Uh, but when we want to combine the signals from the more distant antennas, we have to bring tape recordings of the signals back to a similar computer and, and play the recordings back and then the processing goes pretty much the same way as it does here in real time. Obviously, your tape recording have to be very accurate. How accurate? We have to get the timing uh, between the signals from the different tape recorders accurate to uh, about one part in a million millionth of a second, which of course requires that we have atomic clocks at each of the telescopes. Uh, the tape recorders themselves are, are banks of video cassette recorders so that we can uh, uh, record the enormous quantity of data that we need to, to achieve the sensitivity that is required of these observations. I well remember that in the early days of radio astronomy, the trouble was a lack of resolving power, a lack of resolution. That certainly isn't the case today. How did you solve it? Well, over the years, uh, radio astronomers have, of course, been able to build bigger and bigger antennas, but there comes a point where you can't build bigger antennas to achieve higher resolution. So the problem has been solved by the process we use here at Narrabri of having antennas spread out over a large distance, kilometres in this case, but hundreds of kilometres when we combine uh, signals from the more distant antennas. In 1987, a very important event occurred. A supernova flared up in the large cloud of Magellan. Unfortunately, too far south to be seen from anywhere from Europe or the continental United States. It was discovered in Chile, and we've done many broadcasts about it. Obviously, it's being closely followed from here at Narrabri, and in charge of the observations is Dr. Mr. Stavely Smith. The advantage of observing at radio wavelengths is we can image the outer shock front that uh, was set off by the supernova in 1987. And uh, this shock front is currently moving at a speed of about 30,000 kilometers a second, a tenth the speed of light. and. Uh, the radio regime is the only wavelength at which the outer shock front can be seen at the present time. What are the latest results? Well, the latest results uh, from the compact array are shown in this uh, image here, which shows the expanding remnant of the supernova to basically have a shell-like uh, morphology, and the diameter of that shell is consistent with an expansion velocity of about a tenth the speed of light. Uh, but there are two hot spots to the east and west of the supernova, which we believe are associated with the uh, optical appearance of the nebulosity around the, the supernova. What about interactions with the Hubble ring? And what is the Hubble ring, anyway? The Hubble ring was uh, obviously made famous by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's a, a ring of material, a very small ring of material, located around the supernova and uh, pictured in this uh, image here from the Hubble Space Telescope and shows the circumstellar material that uh, was ejected by the star before it went uh, supernova. The supernova is in the middle of this image here and the ring is, uh, uh, lies around the supernova. It's uh, actually a circular ring but it's uh, tilted with respect to our line of sight. And this, uh, this ring was illuminated uh, by the ultraviolet flash from the supernova when it went bang. And when the shock front from the supernova, as imaged in the radio, 
uh, catches up with this ring, there will be some fireworks in the optical and in the X-ray regime and, of course, in the radio regime. When will that be? Uh, that's likely to be at the end of this, uh, towards the end of the century. Uh, the date of about 2005 has widely been quoted, but our recent results tend to suggest it'll be somewhat before, before then, maybe five years before then. So the end of this decade looks the most likely date. So far, no definite sign of a pulsar. No definite sign of a pulsar yet, various false alarms, but uh, as yet no sighting. I think I'm right in saying that the real importance of this supernova is that you're going to be able to go on studying it for years, which, of course, with a supernova in the remote galaxy, you can't because it fades. Yes, indeed. This uh, supernova is about 100 times closer than the closest supernova we've seen in recent times, and therefore we can follow the radiate evolution of this supernova uh, basically until it becomes a supernova remnant, which uh, will occur in about 100 years' time. So over a very long time span, we can follow the evolution of this remnant and study the way that, that supernovae interact with their environment and supernova remnants are formed. When most people think about radio astronomy, they think of traces on a graph, but you're getting pictures. Yes, what uh, we're working with now is a synthesis telescope which uses the Earth's rotation to form a two-dimensional image over a period of uh, 12 hours. So after a 12-hour observation with the Australia telescope, we get a picture. The whole Australia Telescope project is very exciting. It's also very new, isn't it? Yes, the, uh, the Australia Telescope, though, comprises uh, the old Parkes 64-meter telescope, which you've already uh, been looking at, uh, and two new components. There's a compact array here at Narrabri spread out on a railway line so that they can be spread out to six kilometers, which is what you do when you want uh, very fine detail on a small object or you can run them in on the railway line so you get a, a wide angle and then you look at large objects with low resolution. And then the third component is the ability to combine parks, the Narrabri compact array, and a new telescope at Mopra to form a, what we call a long baseline array. What particular types of objects are going to be the main targets? Well, since these are the main radio astronomy facilities in the southern hemisphere, Obviously, anything which is unique to the Southern Hemisphere is very important. So there's the center of the galaxy, obviously the Magellanic Clouds, and in fact, the nearest radio galaxy, Centaurus A, uh, is also uh, at minus 45, so very much a Southern Hemisphere object. What are the ultimate aims? Well, for the moment, this kind of research, uh, people think of the questions of the structure of the universe, problems of the missing mass, and then, of course, there's always this intriguing question of what powers the nuclei of active galaxies. Are there black holes there? What have been some of the latest results? Well, just last night, we were making one of the very exciting observations of the supernova remnant, which is now forming uh, around the uh, location of the supernova 1987A. Uh, another example is here in the galactic center. Uh, this is an image which was made with the most synthesis telescope of the galactic plane. Uh, right here in the middle is the center of the galaxy, and there's a rather inconspicuous little region. When that was imaged with the Australia telescope, it was found to be this very strange object, which has been nicknamed the snake. There's nothing like this uh, been seen before anywhere else in the galaxy, and uh, there's a great deal of argument about what can possibly be making uh, this kind of object. When you say images, you mean, of course, radio images, not optical images. That's right. A telescope uh, like the compact array here at Narrabri uh, is, is done this way in order to achieve the resolution of an optical telescope at radio wavelengths. And it builds up what we refer to as an image, but in fact, it's all made at radio wavelengths. But it has the same kind of detail that you expect in an optical photograph. Another example which has resulted from the versatility of this telescope uh, is being able to observe at some frequencies which have not been available before. And around 6 gigahertz uh, is uh, a methanol maser has been discovered. And one of our scientists has recently discovered a very unusual situation in that these methanol maser spots uh, form a line on either side of, um, of presumably a star which is in the middle. 
And it's just possible that this uh, could be an indication of a protoplanetary disk, and these might be the regions of planet formation. What exactly are methanol mazes? Ah, well, methanol is uh, uh, wood, wood alcohol, a form of alcohol, but it exists out in space. And uh, some of these molecules in space uh, maze. That is, the, uh, uh, the, in, in the same way as a laser amplifies light, a maser amplifies, ra amplifies radio waves. And the methanol molecules have uh, inverted populations of their spectra, and they can amplify the waves and make them very strong. So it's very easy to see this particular kind of molecule uh, using the radio telescopes, even at very great distance. What about jets in galaxies? Ah, well, we have a very exciting result on jets in galaxies. This object here, which was observed uh, last year, is uh, a giant radio galaxy. And in fact, the jet has been seen extending all the way uh, over a region which is one and a half million light years in size. And that's now the record as the longest uh, jet which has been seen in these radio galaxies. Are you working in conjunction with other arrays, such as Merlin in England? Well, uh, of course, as you know, Patrick, with the very long baseline technique, we can combine with other telescopes anywhere in the world, but the other telescopes have to be able to see the same object at the same time. So unfortunately, Merlin is on the other side of the world, so we don't have objects that we can both see. So when we combine with other telescopes, uh, we're developing um, a network of telescopes in the Asian Pacific region, in particular telescopes in China and Japan, and we can also combine with telescopes on the west coast of the US. Perhaps uh, even more exciting for the future is combining with telescopes in space. The, the Russians have the Radio Astron program to uh, launch a telescope in space, and the Japanese have what's uh, called the VSOP project uh, to put a telescope in space. Now, once the telescopes are in space, they see objects in the north and the south, and so, of course, they very much need telescopes in the southern hemisphere. And so the telescopes, which we've just been talking about, the Parks, the Narrabri, and at Mopra, uh, will be very important for linking with these space telescopes for observing any of the southern objects. We've had plenty of optical telescopes in space, including the Hubble Space Telescope. But so far, there haven't been any really big radio telescopes in space. These will be the first, except for some very low frequency observations that were made with, uh, with, with uh, radio telescopes in space some time ago at frequencies which were too low to get through the ionosphere. But this is the first real radio telescope in space, yes. Is the Australia telescope as good as you expected? Oh, yes. It's uh, been performing extremely well. And we have scientists from all over Australia and from all over the world uh, coming here, making observations. And so we now have in the Southern Hemisphere a high-resolution imaging radio telescope, which can complement all the fine optical telescopes in Australia and Chile. Half a century ago, there was only one intentional radio telescope in the world. That was in Tasmania, built by Groot Reaver. Today, radio astronomy has become one of the most important branches of modern science, and Australia remains in the forefront. This great new network has already proved its worth, and in the years to come, it will do a great deal in helping us toward a better understanding of the universe.